Next, we'll have Dr. Kaltalia. I hope I'm pronouncing properly. Probably I'm not. Is Dr. Kaltalia here? Good morning, Frijo, uh, dear audience. And I thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important discussion. And uh, I feel a little bit underhand because I seem to be the only one here who is not a native English speaker, but hopefully I've managed. I'm Rita Kertokaltia. I worked in Tampere University in Finland, in Northern Europe, as a professor of adolescent psychiatry, and I'm also the chief psychiatrist in um, Tampere University Hospital Department of Adolescent Psychiatry, where we have one of the two nationally centralized gender identity teams for minors. We have been seeing a gender identity patients since 2011, and I have been participating in the clinical work, meeting practically all adolescents who have in Finland ever proceeded to hormonal interventions with gender identity indication, because I'm not only seeing all the patients in our unit, but I also see all those patients who have been referred to hormonal treatments in a so-called second opinion visit, which they need to make to our unit. My research work also nowadays primarily centers around gender identity issues, and I have published extensively since we started to do the gender identity assessment with minors. And I also have to notice, observe here that my opinion about the quality of evidence and, and what is the best interest in, of minors in this issue is rather different from some of the other opinions we have already heard today. So in Finland, the regulation is as follows. Diagnostic assessment that may result in medical gender reassignment is in Finland centralized by code of law to two of the five university hospitals in the country, and, and they are considered that they are 11 services. The whole population is, by the way, only 5.3 million, so you may wonder why so small numbers, but we are not such a huge nation. Both of these centers have a unit for adults and another unit for minors. And in these uh, gender identity teams, mental health teams perform the diagnostic assessment and a pediatric endocrinology team or hormone polyclinic uh, based on their gynecology as appropriate bear the responsibility for initiating and balancing hormonal interventions. When hormonal interventions have been balanced, this mainly concerns those patients who are on cross-sex hormones, the hormonal long-term care, hormonal care is transferred to local services. Surgeries with gender in dysphoria indication are available only for legal adults. This is from age 18 and the bilateral from the Apple mentioned assessment teams. Genital surgery is centralized to one center in the country. Legislation level can never give actual practical clinical guidelines and so national guidelines for treatment were issued 2020 by the COHERA Finland, which is a body under Ministry of Health and Welfare that has the responsibility of outlining what kind of services are available in publicly funded services or by reimbursed by national health insurance in Finland. We also have another system of service guidelines, which is by the Scientific Society, Nordekim, and they give a guidelines in, in line with, for example, ARCAP's practice parameters. But here we have a bit more official level given guidelines by COHERA Finland. The national guidelines for the treatment of gender dysphoria in children and adolescents define that with children, we only provide possible interventions to associate with difficulties. So it is well known that 80% up to even up to 85% of children who experience gender dysphoria and cross-sex identification feel differently when they reach puberty after the early phases of puberty. And therefore, any medical interventions are not recommended to prep for that children. Also, you cannot make the identity assessment and kind of prepare for possible medical interventions before the puberty has started because the onset of puberty is such an important phase in the gender identity experience and in consolidation of the gender identity for those who have gender identity issues from childhood. 
take adolescents, the first like treatment of gender dysphoria is exploratory psychotherapeutic intervention in local services. And this has to be provided in the level of care that is otherwise appropriate, given the adolescent's possible associated difficulties. If the adolescent is thriving and doing well and does not have any psychiatric treatment needs, then it has to be the primary care level services, such as student health, who provides the exploratory intervention. And if the adolescent is experiencing psychiatric symptoms or mental disorders, then this intervention can be intertwined with appropriate psychiatric treatment according to their needs. Appropriate treatment of possible psychiatric comorbidities and management of associated needs, such as, for example, pedagogical needs or child welfare needs, have to be, before considering actual gender identity assessment, is also included in the guidelines. If considering medical gender reassignment after the first-line interventions appear appropriate and timely, the referral to the nationally centralized gender identity services can be issued. Then the actual gender identity assessment and diagnostics that may result in medical gender reassignment interventions is taking place in the nationally centralized services. These assessments take place in a multidisciplinary assessment with the young person and their guardians. The professionals who participate in this multidisciplinary assessment include child and adolescent psychiatrists, psychologists, social worker, and a psychiatric nurse. And these assessments comprise multiple meetings over a period of six to 12 months. In practice, it's more close with about 12 months. And very rarely they, they can do it in six months. And they cover the following phases, excluding contraindications, such as, for example, if nevertheless they find that there are uh, severe psychiatric comorbidities that warrant treatment more urgently, then the adolescent is first referred to appropriate psychiatric treatments. The next step is the assessment of gender identity in the context of identity development at large and evaluation of how well the developmental tasks of adolescents are progressing. And next, there will be the assessment of readiness. So we explore the expectations of the young person and the family and how realistically they see the possible interventions and the outcome of the interventions and whether they have the appropriate resources and psychological strength for possible medical interventions that are not an easy step for an adolescent and also require appropriate developmental support and psychological resilience. And then based on the, all those previous uh, steps, then follow appropriate referrals and follow up of the young person. If the young people proceed to hormonal interventions, they remain in our follow-up until uh, they have completed the treatments they currently desire. We first prepare to follow up them until the end of all treatment, but it has turned out that this is impractical because many adolescents, after initiating hormonal treatments, they do not proceed to sur surgical interventions, particularly not to genital surgery, so quickly that it would be appro appropriate to keep the follow-up in the adolescent uh, mental health team. Therefore, nowadays, uh, this starts the young people from our follow-up individually in a suitable phase of, of the course of the treatment and absolutely before age 20 anyway, and they are transferred to adult services if they further continue going further in treatment. During the assessment period, a transfer to more appropriate or more timely interventions can take place at any stage of assessment if those needs appear. If medical interventions are initiated based on gender identity indication, for childhood onset gender dysphoria that intensifies in puberty, where there are no severe psychiatric comorbidities and there is appropriate development as unmuted. And this would be the patient group originally described as the model patients for the so-called Dutch model of care. Dr. Well, Doctor, you know, we are past the 10 minute mark, so I really appreciate it. We can wrap it up quickly. Uh, you have already spent 10 minutes, so I appreciate it. We can wrap it up quickly. Sorry, I, I really don't hear, but you obviously asked me to be quicker. Yeah. So uh, for this, we can offer GNRH analogs to help pubertal development from early stages of puberty and cross-sex hormones from about 16. Thank you so much. Let me have the board members ask any questions of the good doctor.
Yeah, Dr. Hunter. Dr. Katiala, can you hear me? Right at when you were finishing, you were mentioning that children with or youth that could not have co I think you were if I understood you correctly, could not have mental health issues at the time of transition. Then we're hearing from Dr. Jansen that transition helps with mental health issues, comorbid mental health issues. Could you clarify what you understand there about the comorbid mental health issues um, and if transition helps or does yes, not? Yes, uh, mental health comorbidities are often discussed in the light that they would be secondary to gender dysphoria. But actually, we have observed, and I have also published this finding, that many of the adolescents who are referred to our service suffer from long-term mental health issues which are severely impairing their adolescent development and functional capacities, and that have had the onset, well before the onset of gender dysphoria, so that the gender dysphoria has first emerged in the context of severe, functionally impairing mental health problems. In this case, I think it is not possible to conclude a persistent identity because so severe mental disorders impair the identity development and there are great risks in concluding that gender identity would be so fundamental and stabilized that it would be safe to proceed to hormonal interventions, not to mention surgical interventions based on gender identity. So I consider it of utmost importance and severe psychiatric disorders first be treated into remission. Very seldom we see patients where you could think that the mental health comorbidities would only be secondary and mild, which is often stated in the literature. There is no basis for such statements. I have also myself reviewed the literature and the evidence because it is often stated that the gender reassignment will also help in the mental health difficulties and the functional impairments. This is not the case. There is no evidence base for such claims. Literature and the research on the impact of gender reassignment of mental health is lousy at best. And I cannot conclude based on my own reviews and the reviews by Kohera Finland and also the CAS review and some other experts that there is evidence to say that mental health difficulties, psychiatric disorders would remit if an adolescent who is also experiencing gender dysphoria is given gender reassignment interventions. These are separate problems. If the psychiatric problems seem to be more fundamental, they have to be treated first. Speaking to what you said at the beginning about you had some other opinions about the evidence in general, could you share about that, not just the mental health, but the overall evidence in general? You may be wondering why I seem to have a different evidence from the American speakers. Yes, this is an interesting question, but I have myself reviewed the evidence for the impact of radical gender reassignment on mental health in children and adolescents for a webinar of VPATH and Society of Sexual Medicine. And also this was presented in the Congress of European Professional Association for Transgender Health and also invited to be repeated in the European Society of Pediatric Endocrinology. And this is really my sincere understanding that the evidence is lousy. Research on the impact of child and adolescent gender reassignment, medical reassignment, and gender adolescents is mainly comprising the one Dutch study, which can be criticized because they didn't have a comparable comparison group, and it only included some 70 patients, when we are now treating tens of thousands of patients all around the world. So 70 patients as a model for treatment for tens of thousands of patients. I find it really lousy, and it's not in the same level as is usually expected for evidence-based medicine in any field of medicine nowadays. And the other treatment studies after the Dutch study have been even worse. They only have a handful of patients. The follow-up times is up to one or two years only. They have been using a variety of instruments and they mainly have not been able to demonstrate an improvement of mental health or functional capacity, functional abilities. And they have also not reported who were the patients who were not included in the study. So there is no basis for critically judging what kind of group is the treatment group. Uh, representative of. So evidence is lousy in general and regarding mental health and progression of adolescent development in particular. I am convinced in the light of current evidence that there is evidence 
that interventions that modify secondary sex characteristics really modify secondary sex characteristics. Whereas almost all the other claims of their effectiveness is uh, questionable, based on questionable quality studies. One last question. Um, I understand there's been significant changes in the way Finland does things, Sweden, and the NHS, and that this is a difficult maybe, but why are they making those changes? What's driving that? Why are? Why are these changes happening in Europe? That may be too big of a question. Oh, in, I, we have, I have in, in Europe gone towards more conservative because of the observations that the treatment, the impact of treatment on the adolescents' mental health functioning and thriving in every way in the society are not that great. So they have been increasing concerns about the quality of the assessments and also the impact of the treatments and the miserable results on mental health and functioning. And it also, it's the matter that the patient mix has changed totally. The Dutch literature originally was based mainly on patient groups where there were childhood onset gender dysphoria cases in children with male sex. Now we are seeing increasing numbers of adolescent onset cases in young people with female sex. And about this condition, the natural cause of this condition and optimal treatments for these conditions, we know nothing about. There is no literature about what is the natural cause of adolescent onset gender dysphoria. And even the literature in favor of the Dutch model of care was modest at its best when we consider the optimal patients for the Dutch model of care, which I defined earlier. But now we are treating totally different patient mix, and there is no evidence what should be the treatment options for this patient group. Therefore, I personally think that actually hormonal treatments on a gender dysphoria indication for children and adolescents should preferably be limited into the context of formal research studies at the moment. Well, thank you, Dr. Kalatia. Let's move on to our next expert. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Coming all the way from Finland, we really appreciate it.